Welcome to another edition of 30 Minutes with the Author. I'm your host, Lori Creever. Today we're joined by Minnesota author Eric Dregney. Welcome. Thank you. You have written a number of books, so let's start with the bowling book. Let's do the bowling book first. All right. Where did you get the idea to do this great compendium of bowling? It's history, how it's advertised, who participates and why? Um, well, working together with one of the editors down at, uh, at Motor Books, we came up with the idea, and then I took a trip down to St. Louis to the International Bowling Hall of Fame. Which is just one of the Bowling Hall of Fames, correct? Well, it's the international. It's the big one. <laughs> it used to be in Milwaukee, like in the suburb of Milwaukee, yeah. and then they moved it to St. Louis, and Milwaukee barely recovered. I bet. What a scandal. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's Laverne and Shirley, Happy Days, you know, all that Absolutely. stuff. That's bowling. That's... I mean, being from Minnesota, close to Wisconsin, you know, it should be there. We feel the Milwaukee influence. Mm -hmm. We definitely do. So you yeah. went down to St. Louis, you explored the International Bowling Hall of Fame, mm -hmm. and, and you were hooked as a writer? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty, well, this, it's it, reading all these old books, too, about how to bowl, and then they talk a little, there's the first chapter is always about the history, and they have all these theories, and, you know, they're, they just throw it out there, like, well, you know, we think that the Romans started it because they rolled these bricks down on the, you know, the Goths from the north, and so, well, that's how bowling started. And then, no, 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 it's the Egyptians. The Egyptians, Because yeah. the Egyptians had this little game that they had a little shoot that they rolled it down to and knocked some things over, and then... No, are, you, the, are you saying that there are Egyptian hieroglyphics that depict a game yeah, similar to bowling? There's one in the book. We found one. Yep. Interesting. And then who else is claiming his, the... Well, the origin. The, in, there's an Indonesian, Polynesian game mm -hmm. that's similar to it. And then, of course, the Germans claim it. The Grimm brothers, the brothers Grimm, they actually did research that proves definitively that bowling is, in fact, German. Interesting. And, well, there is that relationship, it appears, with beer. Mm -hmm. Yep, so. beer, bowling. <laughs> and a lot of the bowling alleys <laughs> in the U.S. were started by German immigrants and Polish immigrants and... And so it's that Teutonic tradition, you know, from middle of Europe. Mm -hmm. So how long have we been enjoying the sport and the recreation of bowling in the United States, roughly, based on your research? Well, since the beginning. Because when uh, Henry Hudson came to New York, mm -hmm. uh, well, okay, the, the Dutch actually brought it over. Because the first bowling alley, you'll know, is Bowling Green in New York, right down oh, there, Queens. right near the World where the World Trade Centers were. Okay. Um, right. Still have a subway station named that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's still a park there, and there's still the bowling green. Mm -hmm. You know, right amidst all of the skyscrapers, they set aside this area. That's the bowling alley, the original bowling alley in the U.S. I mean, outside, of course. Do you think there was bowling on Thanksgiving, that that was part of the interchange? Uh, you know, I don't know, because <laughs> the Puritans, they had wanted nothing to do with bowling. Anti-bowling. Yeah, it was, it was deemed just sacrilege, like gambling and... You know, led to drinking and all sorts of awful things. So there's mm -hmm. actually lots of old laws banning bowling. Oh my goodness. Now, in our generation, of course, we're very spoiled because it, of the pins. It's all automated. Mm -hmm. But what was life like before the machine set up the pins? And there was teenagers yep. who, that was their job, was to set up those pins. It sounds so dangerous. Yeah, the pin boys. You never two ball a pin boy. That was the rule. <laughs> Because you had to wait until they finished pulling the old pins, the knocked down pins off yeah. the lane, and so they're off the lane. Um, and yeah, it was a dangerous sport because they would stand back there right above the pins, mm -hmm. and if the pins went flying too hard, you know, they could get hit. Well, yeah, and they're heavy. Yeah, very heavy. So that was a very big advance then mm -hmm. when the machines were invented to set those pins yeah. automatically. But you know, all of these teenagers, they lost their jobs. They lost their jobs, right. So, you know, it's another one of... They had to rent shoes. Yep. Be a shoe rental shoes. person. Yeah, and they had to go spray the disinfectant and all the shoes. <laughs> wow. um, one of my uh, professors at the university, Charlie Sugnet, was a pin boy. That was his first job, and he was all upset about the automatic pin setters. He was like, you know, we lost our jobs for first automation, just like in Detroit, how all workers lose their jobs to the big robots. Yeah, for the car industry. Yep. Interesting. Now, something else I thought was interesting in the book is the history of bowling in the White House. Mm -hmm. There was a, a U.S. president Truman. last century that yep. 
had a bowling alley created in the White House. Yeah, and it, I think it's two lanes down there, and they're still there. Mm -hmm. They still use them, they're functional. Um, yeah, Harry Truman set it up, and there's a real famous picture of him bowling mm -hmm. there, and you know, because he wanted to be one with the people, and bowling is considered a blue collar sport, and you know, Truman was more of a, compared to Roosevelt, was more of a blue collar president. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, they still use it. You know, Richard Nixon was a big bowler, mm -hmm. and there's a picture of him bowling. He went uh, to the oldest, oldest alley I was able to find was in Scotland and uh, Edinburgh. It's called the Sheep's Head Inn. Yeah. And uh, Richard Nixon bowled there. And that's actually, it's skittle bowling, so their pins are a little different. Okay. And there they take the ball and they throw the ball with both hands, and then you can fling your whole body onto the lane. Wow. So it's a real, I mean, the Scottish I've sports. done that, but by accident. <laughs> and then it's considered a foul in you know, ten pin bowling, but with skittle, with this particular alley, that's how it's done. You know, because all the Scottish sports of brawn, they throw telephone poles and stuff. So oh my goodness. They can't goodness. just bowl, they have to. I don't think I would fit in there, probably. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think the appeal is of bowling? Because I have to say this, I have a young child, loves to bowl. Really, truly enjoys it. It's a great pastime. When I was growing up, my mom was in a bowling league. Mm -hmm. My brother-in-law's in a bowling league. Just yesterday at work, I work in an office, and one of the women I work with said, gosh, I wish I could find a bowling league to sign up for. What do you oh, think this is this okay. everlasting appeal of bowling? That you don't have to be good to start out bowling. You know, you can just go. It's not like playing cricket or baseball that you have to learn all these rules. It's just mm -hmm. you throw the ball and you knock down those pins. And sure, the first time you go, you're going to get lots of gutter balls. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's a social sport. You're there with your friends. You know, you, it's, it's fun. It's not, you don't, a team sport, but it's individual at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you don't have to rely on everybody else. And That's true, and there is an ample time for being social, mm -hmm. really, because you're just active when it's your turn. Yep. Otherwise, the rest of the time, you can be Talking enjoying your friends, yeah. having conversation. Trying to figure out how to score. Yeah, I mean, exactly. now they have all these automatic scores, which I think is sort of cheating. You know, you have to do the old, write it all That's down. That's right. That's right. And mind if I ask, do you bowl? Do I bowl? Yeah. I don't bowl, I'm not in any sort of league, and yeah. I, I'm a, a casual bowler, I think. Okay. Um, but when I was growing up, my, one of my best friend's dad owned the Aqua Bowl out in Minnetonka, mm -hmm. and so that was, that was where we all gathered, all of our friends, because it was a family place. They didn't serve beer. They, the owner said, nope, no, none mm -hmm. of that. Wanted to keep it a family thing. Um, so this was the town square for us out oh, in Minnetonka. That's nice. And I know we were sort of joking earlier, but it is true, I think, that probably both Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley, those two ABC television shows in the 1970s, mm -hmm. they did a lot also to just remind people of how fun it is yep. and how social it is to go bowling. Mm -hmm. And remember Bowling for Dollars? Yes. That was about the same time, too. And, you know, that was prime time. Yes. And can you still find professional bowling on, on television, on ESPN or something? I mean, does it get covered? Yeah, I mean, they have some of the tournaments are covered, mm -hmm. yeah. What was the most surprising thing that you learned when you were researching the book? There's so many great pictures in here of the advertisements over the years that have incorporated bowling in it, like oh. for Coca-Cola. I mean, whether or not they were advertising bowling-related products, mm -hmm. how they would use bowling. Um, I think one of the historical things that I was the most surprised about was that because uh, bowling was considered a little, uh, we had St. Bonifacius from England went, supposedly one of the stories is he brought bowling to Germany and transformed, converted all the heathens there by bowling. And so hmm. by bowling, you're knocking down the devil. Hmm. So each pin you hit is considered doing another good deed for Christ. Interesting. But then, of course, you know, people hanging out bowling, smoking, drinking, it got a little bit of a bad reputation over the centuries. Yes. So then it was turned around that it was actually the devil's game. Because there's a picture of the devil with a skull yes. bowling. And so then it was thought that he's knocking down crosses with each pin. So, like, all this religious imagery around mm -hmm. bowling was just, I mean, that is it's astonishing. crazy stuff. Wow. So let's switch to a different pastime that you've also written about. Okay. <laughs> scootering. Yeah. 
I've written about scooters for a long time. And you you are someone who scooters, right? I kind of yeah. get that from I don't have a scooter book. right now, but I had a Lambretta LD from 1963, cool old scooter, which I probably pushed more than I drove. <laughs> you know, you tinker with the old ones. <laughs> yeah. They're great when they run, but you know, you have to you have to get your hands dirty. Mhm. Mm so how long has scootering been around? Uh, we've now traced the first scooter. We thought it was it, the first scooter was American, but then it turns out it was French from 1907 or so. But then wow. we found a Danish one from 1902. Wow! So and it's you know it's everybody research. I mean, there's a lot of research done into motorcycles and automobiles, but scooters nobody has done it. Yeah, that's what I thought when I was reading your books. Yeah. And so we kept coming up with more and more stuff, and just you know, I mean, it's you know. I know it sounds sort of arcane and trivial unless you're into scooters, but to be to find out this early information and be the first ones to find it, it's pretty exciting actually. Yes. Oh yes. It's like it the is. earliest ones back and who influenced whom and And what was the motivation, you know, that's saying that necessity is the mother of invention? What was it? People were bicycling, but some people didn't have the strength or mm -hmm. ladies with the long dresses or something? I mean, who do you think put two and two together and said, let's create a motorized bicycle type well, type of thing? Yeah, I think it was mostly people get tired of walking. And so they want to yeah. move. And then scooters originally were, you know, like the, now there's this revival of these little children's push scooters, the razors and all those. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some of the earliest scooters look like that. And they would be women with dresses okay. that wanted to stand on the little running board and then just hold on to something and put along the sidewalk because mm -hmm. that's what they were made for to go like 10 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. um, but actually the earliest ones had a little seat and with the step through they were made for women with dresses mm -hmm. and, and then the engine was usually covered so they wouldn't get mud splashed up on them. Mm -hmm. And then they were often, they were auto, I mean nowadays almost all of them are automatics so you don't have to deal with all the shifting yeah. like on a motorcycle so they're real easy to drive. And the small wheels make them easy to move around. Mm -hmm. I mean, this gets, you know, I could talk a lot about all the different specifics of scooters, but yeah, it's, it's uh, fun stuff. Um, the only exposure that I had ever had really to scooters, I think, was seeing the Vespa store downtown Minneapolis. Oh, yeah, which is gone now. And it, yeah, that's right. And it does seem, am I right that? The Italian manufacturers seem to have more of a corner on this market and have for some time. Yep. Is that correct? Well, it's actually now it's mostly India and China and Taiwan. And, but I mean, Italian, I mean, it's the Vespa. Yeah. Um, How long has Vespa been around? Since 1946, mm -hmm. um, right after the war. Because um, when the Allies went in and just bombed everything, all those factories, Piaggio was the parent company of Vespa, mm -hmm. they couldn't make war planes or anything. So they had to find out something to do with all of this, these spare parts. Oh. That's why the wheels are the size they are because they're from old airplanes. And you know, with the front fork that kind of curves around. So they, it's the scooter, most people think it's just a little motorcycle, but it's actually sort of a mixture between a car, because it's covered, okay. an airplane, yeah, because of all of that, and some people say a helicopter. How interesting. Do you so, know what the word Vespa means? Mm -hmm. I mean, does it translate? Does it mean? It's wasp. Wasp. Because it sounds like a wasp. Yeah. Zzz, and then it looks like a wasp because it has the rear. The old ones are mm -hmm. real bulbous. As the rear coming down, it looks like a stinger. Mm hmm. Oh, that's true. It really does. Now, what was the other brand name that you said? Lambretta. That, yeah. That's named after a, a dirty river in Milan. <laughs> Lombardo. Yeah. Did you live in Italy? Yeah, I lived in Italy for four years, four and a half years. Mm -hmm. So I'd see them all over the place. Yeah. And that's actually how it started. I went over there in high school. Okay. And you see all these great scooters cruising around. And I had class. I was I spent my senior year of high school there, and my classmates had these Vespas and little Vespa gangs, and so they're Vespa cruising gangs. around. Yeah, oh, they're all over the place. And, wow. Because I mean, their kids drive them because the adults are now dr driving their Fiats and their mm -hmm. Ferraris and whatever. They're really they're so much fun. Around little cobblestone streets.